Welcome, welcome everybody. My name is Leah Emanuel and I'm the Community Partnerships and Training Manager at the Sydney Policy Lab and I am delighted to be your chair for tonight. Tonight we are going to take you across our city and our country to hear from leaders who are confronting the challenges that we're all facing today. And we have plenty of challenges right now. Our aim tonight is not to catalogue the problems, but to offer pathways of hope. It is a time that we need hope. And to find hope, we want to start the evening right and begin with the power and voice of an Aboriginal leader we are honoured to have with us tonight. I'd like to invite Yvonne Weldon, Chair of the Metropolitan Local Aboriginal Land Council, to begin this evening's Welcome to Country. Yvonne. Thank you. Hello, ladies and gentlemen, sisters and brothers. As I said, my name is Yvonne Weldon. I am a Wiradjuri woman from Cara here in New South Wales. I'm from the waters of the Clare, which later became known as the Lachlan and of the Murrumbidgee Rivers. I am the elected chairperson of the Metropolitan Local Aboriginal Land Council, who are the culture authority under the Aboriginal Land Rights Act for the land that I am on. I'd like to pay my respects to all elders past and present to all First Nations, to you and the many nations of lands that you're on. Our boundaries are known and are lived through our interconnection across this continent, not from the roads and man-made landmarks, but through the natural landscapes of the earth. The Our Nations country covers the Hawks River in the north, the Nepean in the west, and the Georges River in the south. My people have practiced our traditions for thousands of years and endless generations. One tradition that is shared in various forms across Australia is a welcome to country. It isn't a token gesture, it is a spiritual process, giving honour to the ancestors' footsteps we are all walking in, continuing the practice of the many generations before us to the many generations to come. As you travel across this beautiful continent of ours, you are crossing the lands of hundreds of nations, tribes and clans that have existed here for over 60,000 years. My people are the oldest continuously living culture of the world. And on behalf of the Metropolitan Local Aboriginal Land Council, the elders and the members, I welcome everyone to the land of the Gadigal. I acknowledge the Gadigal people and also the peoples of lands that you're on today, whose spirits and ancestors will always remain with these lands, our mother earth. My people have always listened and learned from each other, the environment, animals, elements, and our ancestors. We don't live in isolation of body, culture, spirit, land and water, because we are one. We need to reflect upon what has taken place to bring about a positive future for everyone. Being gathered online for this important event, could you all please pause for a moment to remember the many sacrifices that have been made along the way, the ones we will continue to make, and those we shouldn't have to. Please reflect about those we have lost, the ones we need to continue to help, and so many that don't yet realise they may need you, and also you and what you give to others at the expense of yourself. Let's spare a thought for the families, the friends and the communities, and what we should do as a community of people gathered virtually here today. As you connect, learn and share today, tomorrow and beyond. Know that everyone's social emotional well-being is more important than the material things in this world. Remember reaching out and providing support is an important step for you and the person you are assisting. No matter what walks of life we all come from, we all need to support each other, bringing out hidden heartaches to share and bringing us all a strength together. The road travelled alone is the longest, hardest road there is. Don't do it on your own. I will join you and you can join me. And in these times of this pandemic, don't let the social distance make us socially absent. We need to maintain physical distancing, but not creating barriers to our social connections, creating an inclusion and acceptance and resilience. All of us together can bring about positive changes to multiple generations, because we are in this together. We can bring about positive change to each other now and into the future. 
to make that future possible that is all draw upon my people's spirits as we continue on our journey. May my people's spirits walk with you and guide you as we strive forward for us all. Again, on behalf of the Metropolitan Local Aboriginal Land Council, welcome to Gadigal Land. This always was and always will be Aboriginal land. Thank you and have a wonderful evening. Thank you so much, Yvonne. We are so honoured to have you here with us tonight and for that resounding message. Welcome all to this very important night, Out of the Ordinary, how we can all build a better Australia. For those of us just joining, I'm Lyra Emanuel, the Community Partnerships and Training Manager at the Sydney Policy Lab. I'm currently zooming in from Gadigal and Wongal country, also known as Ashfield in Sydney but I'm not originally from here. I grew up in Fairfield City in the very close knit Assyrian community that like many others is currently being devastated by COVID-19. My parents fled persecution in their home countries to build a better life here in Australia, but I grew up watching them bust their guts, working low paid jobs and battling racism every day. At the same time, I saw mum and dad work tirelessly to build Assyrian community organisations here that would support our people in absence of support from the state. Some of my earliest memories as a child was in our living room, filled with community leaders and elders coming in and out, making plans on how to make life better over cups of steaming hot tea and trays of sweets. In almost 30 years, not much has changed. Like much of Western Sydney, my extended family work in essential industries. They face rising living costs, but without a pay rise. And it's many of the same leaders and organisations that I got to know as a child who are now on the front lines, responding to the COVID crisis as it unfolds in Western Sydney nope. today. Life in Western Sydney has shaped my vocation. It's led me to work in the environment movement, to conduct research with urban poor communities in Indonesia and work with inspiring scholars such as Professor Robin Dowling. I worked with migrant communities in Western Sydney around energy justice with the Sydney Alliance and manufacturing workers across the state with the United Workers Union. And through all this, I have witnessed the power of what is possible when we act together. And with this desire to tackle the big issues alongside the people affected the most by them, that's what brings me to work at the Sydney Policy Lab. The Sydney Policy Lab is one of a kind in Australia, sitting at the juncture of academia, government, industry and civil society. Like the name implies, it's a place where elements that don't normally mix are combined in a safe environment of trust and common purpose. In the lab, we build relationships across unusual divides. We find shared understanding and test hypotheses around wicked problems that too often fall captive to accepted wisdoms and vested interests. Our event tonight is going to unfold in three parts, three acts, if you will. First, we're going to explore the challenges we're all facing right now a nation and a city divided by lockdown in the face of a dangerous pandemic. What does it mean for civil society, for our people? We'll hear about the civic engagement index that the Policy Lab has commissioned and stories from across our city. Then in the second section, we're going to explore the foundations for a solution. How can universities and communities work differently together to co-produce knowledge partnership and ideas that can transform tension and isolation into hope. We'll launch Mark Steer's book, Out of the Ordinary, and hear from Glyn Davis of the Paul Ramsey Foundation. In our final section, we're going to take you on a roller coaster tour of how the Sydney Policy Lab is putting these ideas into practice. We'll run through a range of projects that are already underway using our relational method. And our final speaker for tonight will be the new Vice-Chancellor of the University of Sydney, Mark Scott, 
we are delighted he can join us tonight and share his vision. But to kick us off, I would love to introduce you all to the director of the Sydney Policy Lab, Professor Mark Steers, to welcome you all here tonight. Mark. Hello, everyone. Thank you so much, Leah. And thanks to everybody for joining us uh, tonight. It's just wonderful to see so many familiar names appearing on the Zoom screen, a few of your faces. I wish we were all sat in a crowded lecture theatre on campus like we have been for our three previous uh, annual events. But um, this is a fantastic uh, alternative in the current circumstances. And as Leah says, we're totally delighted by the amazing group of people that we have to share their experiences, uh, stories, uh, plans for the future with us tonight. I just want to start with one key thought. Uh, many of us are going through difficult times right now, some obviously much harder than others. The social isolation, the anxiety and fear, the hard work that the pandemic has placed upon all of us is extremely tough. Uh, and when you look at the social fabric of cities like Sydney, uh, you see it being torn by the different experiences that people are having. You know, there are helicopters in the sky in Fairfield tonight. There aren't helicopters in the sky in Fairlight, where I am coming to you from. Um, the, I don't know what that screen has appeared, but I'll carry on anyway. Um, the key experience that we want to share with you is that coming together across difference and sharing different experiences is, we think, the pathway to hope and the pathway to a better future. So if you'd like, uh, and as, as is appropriate for a lab, we have a hypothesis to put before you tonight, and we really want you to engage in the chat uh, and after this event to see whether we're right. So our hypothesis is this, when people from different walks of life come together, share their stories, share their values, we can build answers to even the most challenging problems. And I want to give you one piece of evidence for this before I hand over to the other speakers who you've all come to hear, uh, not me which is that we worked over the last few months with the polling company Essential Media uh, and with our partners, the Paul Ramsey Foundation, who, with whom we're doing work on the health of Australian civil society, to find out how many people are committed to our country right now, how many people trust our institutions, how many people are finding their way into community life. We asked about different walks of life, generations, as you can see on the slide there, uh, different uh, class groups, different regional groups, different you know, people from experiencing from all different uh, parts of our community. And we discovered two things that I want to share. The first, as you can see right there, which is that there's enormous hope from our young people. Young people in Australia are more trusting and more committed to our civic institutions, to our community life than older people like I am. That has surprised many people when we've uh, reported these findings, which we're going to be releasing tomorrow morning. But I think it's hugely exciting for the future. The other thing we've discovered is that people who come from communities where they speak more than one language, especially where they speak not don't speak English at home or don't speak only English at home, are also more committed, more civically engaged than the norm in the rest of our society. So there is something extremely exciting about what might be possible for Australia. A young, multicultural, eager country, willing, as Yvonne so beautifully put it in her Welcome to Country, to say we can't do this on our own. We need this to do this through our community effort. I think that there's something there. And I think we're going to hear much more about that as we proceed through the rest of the evening. I'm going to leave that opening there and hand back to Leah. And I'm so looking forward to hearing our speakers and also to seeing what your reflections are in the chat as we go through the evening. Leah. Thank you, Mark. And indeed, an index is powerful. Real stories are more powerful still. We want to share real experiences of people battling the pandemic as we speak. First, I'd like to introduce you all to Nima Kabutli. Nima is the acting CEO of Muslim Women Australia a powerful 35-year-old advocacy and service organisation based here in Southwest Sydney. Following Neemat, we'll hear from Chaitra Harish. She's a leader in the Oz International Student Chapter and a part of the Sydney Alliance and the Sydney Community Forum. I'll hand over to Neemat. Thank you so much. It's a pleasure to be here. I'm born and bred in Bankstown and I wouldn't live anywhere else. 
I'm one of five kids and I'm blessed with great parents. My dad's a doctor and mum was a high school teacher. They have lived, worked and raised a family in ways that model justice, love and care. It's why when I was only eight years old in 1999 that my parents decided that I should go to an all-girls youth camp run by Muslim Women Australia. I remember those weekends fondly, sitting cross-legged in a hall with over 100 girls. I remember looking up on the stage and being so surprised. It was not like school where all the leaders were adults and the boss was the principal telling you what to do. The camp was run by a group of girls aged 14 and 15. They walked with a sense of autonomy and agency. I wanted to be just like that. I didn't appreciate my parents' wisdom at the time, but it became clear a few years later why that camp proved to be so important. I was 10 years old when September 11 happened. This, along with the so-called Lebanese gangs and the Cronulla riots, were all macro events that shaped my adolescent years. My community, my people, were under attack by politicians, by journalists, by fellow Sydney siders. Those experiences could have broken me, but they didn't. The MWA camp gave me a sense of security in my identity, strong connections that nurtured me. My understanding of what it was to be an Australian Lebanese Muslim woman wasn't just dictated to me from the outside, it was cultivated within. Today, I'm the deputy CEO of the MWA. I'm a leader and mother of three. My mission at MWA is to provide the same kind of support and connection across my community that I received as a kid. Being a leader during a wild pandemic in an LGA of concern amongst communities of certain backgrounds hasn't been easy. We are doing it very hard. Let me share just one story. One of our leaders, Lena, has a big family. In her home are 11 people, ranging from ages eight to 72. They don't know, oh, she was doing everything right. About two months ago, she booked in for a vaccine. They don't know how COVID came in. It could have been her daughter who works as a childcare worker, her husband who's a baker or at a medical appointment, but it came and it was devastating. They all got it. Three went to hospital. Her dad was in hospital 30 days later, but it wasn't just the disease that was hard. The system was broken. New South Wales Health didn't help them manage the disease. No extra medicines were provided. By the time health made contact, two members of the family were already in hospital. It took four calls before an ambulance took her father to hospital, where he was placed in an induced coma on a ventilator in ICU. The emotional toll on the family, unimaginable. They were contacted by police, but it was for compliance, not support. They would get a call and each of them at the height of the illness would have to stand outside their place in a line, in a roll call, each day for 17 days, as the police made sure they had not absconded. The system delivered little dignity. All the while, every day at 11 a.m., political leaders blamed the sick and people in my community. But a different kind of everyday leader stepped in. With the system stretched, it was grassroots leadership that identified gaps and have been working to fill them to provide healing holistically. Leaders from MWA organized with her GP to provide daily health check-ins. We took a roster and dropped off essential food and medicine. We provided spiritual activism, sending prayers and a sense of hope. We organized to shift her vaccination appointment so a relative could take her spot. Real leadership is not about fancy titles. Leadership is about investing in people and supporting their dignity. This has been the hardest of times for me, for our organisations and our communities, but I have hope that we can make things better because we know how to care for each other. We have the strength to hold ourselves up and we have the wisdom to know that we need to stretch our connections far beyond our communities and build relationships with others through groups like the Policy Lab. Having others believe in me and in turn believing in others makes a real difference. We still have so much to do. Together, by building a chain of love and power, we can turn things around. Together, we truly are better. Thank you. Thank you, Nima. Um, namaste, everyone. My name is Chaitra Harish, and I'm from India. I'm a community organizer at Sydney Community Forum. I came to Australia in 2018. 
On 27th March 2020, we entered a lockdown like never before. My shifts were cut and I was asked to stay home until further notice by my employer. I found out that I had to vacate my house the very next month. I struggled to find a new home because of the uncertainty around how this virus was spreading, of which inspections of a new house became impossible. I never thought I'd be experiencing a situation like this. Where was I to go? I needed shelter, a basic necessity. During this time, I was invited to share my story in a meeting online with other students and community organizers. I realized that I wasn't alone and that my story wasn't unique. That's when my journey as a community organizer began. I remember organizing the very first listening campaign for international students in June. I was nervous, but I got a little more than a little nudge from Nirmal and Asha, veteran community organizers from Sydney Community Forum. In these listening campaigns, we listened to stories of many, many international students They felt anxious, uncertain, and alone. They had lost their jobs. They were underpaid and thought it was normal. They had no way to pay their rent, no way to buy groceries, let alone their student fees. They felt the fear of visa cancellations and deportations. Work exploitation was happening to all those still at work with students in an extreme state of desperation. Listening to all of these stories jangled my nerves. I never felt so galvanized to take action. And we did take action. We worked. We we did power analysis, collecting and sharing testimonies, meeting with MPs, media actions, and over 450 leaders from faith and union organizations, businesses, communities across Sydney. And we worked on developing the voice of the most marginal people in Sydney, those non-citizens. Before I knew it, I was part of a campaign that won 22 million for international students by the NSW government for accommodation. I'm happy to share that I, along with 5,000 students, benefited from this relief. And in January, we received a 100,000 grant from City of Sydney that is resourced until the end of this year. I am at a job at SCF to help fix this exploitation that we faced even before COVID-19. The current lockdown has resurfaced the exact same challenges, uncertainty around whether to stay in Australia or whether we can visit our families struggling back home, no money to pay food and groceries, problems at work, safety. All of this and more has exacerbated mental health issues in the community. But we've only gotten started. And I'm inviting you to join us in creating and resourcing this organization that makes us feel welcome and belonged. Be a part of this legacy that we call a home away from home. Wow. Uh, Thank you, Nima and Chaita. I don't know about you all, but I am covered in goosebumps right now hearing those stories. Clearly, hope comes in many forms. And I'm sure that there are hundreds of stories like this amongst all of you. The next question that arises, of course, is what can we all do? How do we respond to the challenges that we face? We can't all be as creative and heroic as Nima and Chaitra, but what is possible? I want to introduce Dr. Amanda Tattersall. She's our research and education lead at the Sydney Policy Lab and has previously worked for decades as a community organizer. She will lead the second part of our event tonight, including launching Mark Steers' book, which looks at just those questions. Over to you, Amanda. Thanks, Leah. So tonight, we launched Mark Steer's book, Out of the Ordinary. Now, for those who haven't read it yet, it takes us on a journey to explore a group of writers whose work sought to interpret life during World War II and the Blitz. In the book, we meet writers like George Orwell and radio essayists like Dylan Thomas, whose method sought to draw insights from those 
who were living with the horrors of war and lifting up ways that people could build a stronger and more united community. Their work helped inform the movements that gave birth to things like the modern welfare state, to full employment and to the United Nations. They were successful because of how they did their work. Elites at the time were distant from the people. Bureaucrats and benevolent bookish academics pretended to know it all. Outspoken left-wing thinkers privileged ideological answers to the problems that they saw. But Orwell and Thomas were different. They sought to build knowledge out of ordinary experiences, conversations in the pub, in workplaces and in homes. They leaned in to the power of unusual collaborations where people who were different sought to find common ground. They wrote about people who witnessed the challenge of the Blitz and who responded by building the change that they needed in their own lives. Jump forward to today, and this approach is more relevant than ever. Answers to our dislocation and our inequality can't be found on a spreadsheet. Answers arise from leaders like Nimat and Chaitra. Tonight, we are launching Out of the Ordinary with Glyn Davis, Executive Director of the Paul Ramsey Foundation. The Paul Ramsey Foundation is the largest philanthropic fund in the country. Glyn has moved between research and scholarship in his professional life. He was the Director General of the Department of Premier and Cabinet in Queensland, while also being a political scientist. He's been the, uh, also a leader in our higher education sector, having been Vice Chancellor at Griffith University and at the University of Melbourne. So to launch the book, I've got a couple of questions for, for Glyn to consider. Welcome, Glyn. Welcome to the stage. <laughs> so to begin, my first question is this. When you think about some of the possible solutions to the challenges that we face in these times, and you've got plenty of problems you could choose, what did you learn from Mark's book about ways of responding, ways that were based on the insights that he gained from these earlier times? So Mark's book closes with a really interesting vignette. It's a moment of what he calls still life, one of those moments where you look around the world and suddenly you see the world around you in, in a new way or in a different way. And, and Mark describes being in uh, Lincoln Inn Fields in London, waiting for a friend on a summer evening at dusk and suddenly looking around at the people around him and realising all the things they're doing together and seeing that sense of solidarity that comes from, from joint activity. And as you rightly describe, he then attributes this to a series of writers in the 1930s, 40s and 50s who tried to build a picture of, of Britain and understand ordinary life and tried to celebrate sort of common values. And, and if there's one word that runs through it, it's decency all the way through. And, and this is important because he's telling us that this sense of Britain at that moment arose not from politicians and not from intellectual elites. It actually, it came up from a, a shared humanity uh, as expressed by a series of artists and novelists and, and poets. And I tried to think about that in an Australian context that this very strange moment where of course you can't go strolling and seeing groups of people doing anything. Uh, and so you can't have quite the same experience, but um, that idea of turning to the positive, the idea is, is what's so exciting here. Um, it's really easy to, to be rude about elites. It's really easy to criticize experts and heavens knows we've got lots of people who enjoy doing that. Um, you know, we live in a world in which a series of people think they're experts on, on COVID and, and are quite happy to dispense their, their advice. Um, but actually, you can see in the population, you can see in the conversation, you can see in that data that, that Mark showed us just before, lots of people are engaged. There is a conversation that happens below the public conversation, out of the sight of the sort of the hierarchical media that controls much of this. Um, and that's the conversation that's worth trying to draw out and bring forward. Yeah, fantastic. And we can sort of see that here tonight as well with such extraordinary stories. And I'm quite confident that Nima and Chatra are exemplars of the stories mm -hmm. of people, all these squares on this screen, the 380 people with us tonight, 
are people who have these stories and experiences. And Mark's book is about the power of lifting up those experiences. So just the second question, you know, to, to, to finalise the celebration of, of the book. Um, at the lab, we're trying to put into practice many of these arguments that Mark prosecutes, especially about this idea of connection across difference. What's your sense of how important that particular element is right now? I mean, the element of difference. The element yeah, of you're connecting <coughs> across difference, right? Building mm -hmm. building networks across people who have had different experiences. Well, it's interesting to reflect on that to the critical response to Mark's book, which which did after all get the front cover of the Times Literary Supplement. So it was noticed in, in a very powerful way. Um, people wanted to take um, uh, issue with his characterization of Britain. Was it really that united? Was it really that coherent? Um, and and society is always fractured and always feels fractured when you're in it. But you need to step back in one of those still moments that closes the book to say, what have we got in common? What do we share? Uh, what do we know? And we just heard two extraordinary and powerful stories about what life is like in 2021. Uh, in particular communities, uh, and, and they tell us about what people are going through. But you can also hear in those conversations the determination of, uh, to achieve agency, to actually control uh, choices instead of just being delivered them. I'm disappointed with the role of the state, but a sense of community and a sense of people wanting to look after each other and wanting the means to do that. And that's what Mark's book stresses. It's a really distinctive and original contribution because he's saying in the 1940s, people looked back on their, looked at their time and they could see this and we can look back and understand that we should be doing the same for our own time. And there's a message here too about listening to artists and poets and novelists as important sources of advice because something a really good artist does often is distill what's around them and give it coherence even if, uh, even if we struggle to see the vision that they have presented to us. So I, I congratulate Mark. This is an important book. It deserves a wide audience and it's just been a delight to, uh, it was a delight to read it in manuscript and now it's a delight to see it published. Well, thank you for, for celebrating it with us here tonight. We really appreciate you coming along. We also really appreciate the support that the Paul Ramsey Foundation has provided the lab in making many of our projects come to life. So you've highlighted some of the many elements in the book. I'm about to throw to Mark. So Mark, I'm, I'm interested to hear your thoughts about the power of difference, the idea of commonality, but actually recognizing that we that it's not always about unity when we're building common ground and the role of agency in making, in making change possible. Mark, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Amanda. And thank you so much, Glenn, for the extremely kind words and for the fabulous uh, comments that Glenn shared with me as I was preparing the manuscript too, which have been invaluable. Um, I mean, I, I, I think, you know, Glenn has captured it all perfectly there that, you know, I just want to tell one anecdote, if, um, if I might, it's that, it's that kind of night, which is, you know, before I came to Sydney and um, worked at the Policy Lab, I did have a stint in uh, what they call real politics. So I was a speechwriter back in the UK. And um, one day, uh, a politician I was working with came to me and we were chatting about ideas that we'd like to get across in the media, in the public debate. And one of the ideas we came up with was togetherness. Because exactly as Glenn has just said, you know, we live at a time of extraordinary division and polarization when people spend all of the time, you know, sort of shouting at each other on Twitter or condemning each other for one thing or another. Uh, and yet it just seems obvious to me that the answers to the big problems we face have to come through collective action and solidarity and sharing and learning from the perspectives of each other, even if we disagree with each other and even if we have very different um, you know, lifestyles and life backgrounds. Uh, and so you know, this uh, anonymous politician and I sat down and we sketched out a speech uh, on this idea of togetherness and how it could be taken seriously in politics, rather than just being a sort of rhetorical catch all, uh, a line that people might spin from time to time. And uh, we beavered away and we came up with a manuscript and we were pretty pleased with what we would got. And then we sent it to all of the experts, you know, the strategic advisors, the opinion pollsters, the policy gurus uh, in the political party that I was working for. And almost uniformly, they wrote back saying, you can't possibly say any of this. Like, you know, stop, you know, what the hell are you doing? You must have, you've lost it. You know, this is, this is not going to help. Um, and we were perplexed and we went back to all of these advisors, political advisors, and say, why? And they said, well, 
Because, you know, the way that politics works is by dra drawing dividing lines between friends and enemies. You've got to make the other people look bad. You've got to close the doors on their ideas. You've got to humiliate them if you can in public. You've got to, you know, sort of bash them when you get the opportunity. And then you've got to say how your side has got all the right answers, all the best policies, all the best solutions. That's just the name of the game. That's the industry we're in. Uh, so you can't come on and talk meaningfully meaningful, about togetherness because actually, you know, that's going to pull the plug on the way in which we operate here. And it was a profoundly distressing moment for me, not only because I'd written a really good speech that no one was ever going to give, you know, that's bad enough, but because I just thought, if that's true, if that's how serious people think about politics, then how are we going to solve the climate change crisis? Or how are we going to tackle inequality? Or how are we going to tackle racism and the structural disadvantages which so many groups uh, suffer from? It has to be about a coming together. And so, you know, I guess, you know, back then I fell out of love with politics as it was currently run and currently organized. And um, then I was extraordinarily fortunate to come here to Sydney and um, meet Duncan Iverson, who was the, is the Deputy Vice Chancellor of Research here at the University of Sydney, and had a conversation with Duncan about the vision that he had, amongst other people, for a policy lab here, where you could bring people together from different walks of life and different experience to share their wisdom, share their insights, work with scholars and other researchers on campus, and really crack open these problems. And that, for me, is the lesson that I've tried to get across in, in the book, Out of the Ordinary, and trying to develop with all of you wonderful people on the, on the Zoom here tonight in the lab's efforts and endeavors. Put all that long talk in a short phrase, I believe in togetherness. Uh, I don't believe that you can't solve political problems that way. Uh, and I hope that what we're going to show throughout the rest of the evening is that when you do bring people together across difference to have those hard conversations, real answers emerge. Thank you so much, Glenn, Mark and Amanda, um, for those incisive reflections. It's really great to hear about um, the book indeed. But how much we can we actually do some of that in practice? This takes us to the third part of the evening where we have to change the world around them. Tackling the very biggest issues from climate change to COVID, the Sydney Policy Lab's role in these projects isn't just intellectual or theoretical, it's relational. Across these projects, you'll see themes of how we seek to build new kinds of knowledge through relationships between the communities living with these challenges every day and the researchers who can translate the experiences and knowledge from around the world. Together, in relationship, we can build a better Australia. In the process, the university can enrich its historic public role and support uh, leadership for good. Up first, I'm excited to introduce the Real Deal Project. The Real Deal is a creative network of unions, community organisations, climate groups and businesses working since 2019 to bring different communities together to overcome polarisation around jobs and climate. We're going to hear from two fabulous speakers, Anthony Anderson from Geelong and then Elise Ganley from The Real Deal. Over to you, Anthony. How are you? I'd like to start off saying hello, and my name is Anthony Anderson. I am the Secretary Treasurer of the Geelong Trades Hall Council. I used to work at the Ford Motor Company in Geelong for 33 and a half years, where I was a senior shop steward for the Australian Manufacturing Workers Union Vehicle Division on the shop floor for 28 and a half years. I worked in the Ford foundry where some members were exposed to 1400 to 1600 degrees Celsius molten metal. It was hard and dirty work. So after trying to negotiate a heat agreement with the management, I walked into the boss's office and said in short, are you picking up the union's heat policy or I will stop the plant and enforce it anyway? They refused, I stopped the plant. 
The Ford management took me to the Industrial Relations Commission to try and sack me. But the Industrial Relations Commission directed Ford to negotiate with us. So the outcomes, members got better working conditions and heat. I kept my job. I was the first person and pretty sure the only person to enforce the union policy on heat in Australia. The reason I care about climate action is because we need to leave this country and this planet in a better place for the next generation and the generation after that. Now, when the Ford Motor Company announced the closure of their manufacturing plants in Australia, many hundreds of people were impacted across the country. It caused deep pain for a lot of members as generations of families had worked there. I worked with others, with the members, the company, non-government agencies and governments to transition the members into a life after Ford. Was it perfect? Well, many full-time paying jobs and good jobs they are. We still haven't seen good full-time jobs come back personally. And so that's a loss. Workers in industrial communities need people that they can trust. Many workers in Geelong have told me that they trust me in doing the right thing. We at the Geelong Trades Hall have had a long history with working with the wider community, but need the federal government, regardless of which party is in government, to bring proper policies and engage with the community in the process that is about real jobs, real wages and conditions, real environmental outcomes, and with a draft roadmap from where we are to where we need to be. This is why we at the Geelong Trades Hall support a real deal for Geelong. Thank you. Hello, my name is Elise Ganley and I lead the Real Deal Project. I come from regional South Australia, the industrial communities of the Spencer Gulf, unceded Nukunu country. Where I come from, people are used to important decisions being made by people outside of our community not inside our community. And like Anthony, I'm tired of people exercising power for me, but not with me. The real deal is about creating power from the ground up, where Australians from all walks of life can chart a new course in the face of crisis and transition. We'll do that by deploying participatory research, community organizing, and other relationship-based co-design research strategies to chart a way forward together. We live in a period of deep change and uncertainty. And we know there's been a failure to build the national consensus on how we decarbonize. We are polarized, told we have to choose between communities, jobs, and acting on climate. But the real deal is a genuine attempt to rebuild power within communities which are confronting structural change, reducing fear of the future by giving communities agency around what comes next. These kinds of work needs to start locally in these specific contexts, taking into the stories of the place. In Geelong, we are starting with the closure of the Ford factory. In Western Sydney, we know the experiences of Nima, Chaitra and Leah matter. In Gladstone in central Queensland, we understand the importance of the industries, the local port. Everywhere, visions of a better place arise on Aboriginal and Torres Strait land. In each place, we are working to build real partnerships that builds justice for First Nations peoples, while also building change for those who live there now. For us, the role of universities is not simply to produce ideas, but to form the partnerships that together can produce real solutions from the ground up. Amazing. Thanks so much, Tony, Elise, the Real Deal team for sharing your experiences of coming together across difference to address some of the most urgent challenges of our time, including climate change. The lab has also been working on the crisis of mental health. Over the past year, we formed a partnership with the Matilda Centre at the University of Sydney 
to create Australia's mental health think tank. Professor Marie Thiessen is one of the instigators and leaders of this project. One of her key contributions is to work in ways that connect university research, community engagement and policy impact. We are delighted to welcome Marie. Thanks very much, Leah. And it's been a fabulous evening so far. So great to, great to be here. And I'm here as the chair of Australia's Mental Health Think Tank. And that think tank is actually a child of the pandemic. I, I actually really believe it would not have happened without the, the pandemic. So the think tank was established um, with the generous support of BHP Foundation and of course the support of Sydney Uni to bring together evidence and policy ideas across many silos. Um, it really works to try and highlight what works and what doesn't work and really strengthen people's mental health and wellbeing. So, I, you know, in mental health, it's um, really important for us to be identifying solutions, but it's just as critical for us to wade through the hundreds of plans to focus on what we need to do most and then do the hard work of bringing people together um, to really ensure that that happens. And I think as a few of tonight's speakers have really touched on from their own personal experience and from the experience of their organisations is that we are in the midst of a mental health crisis. And as a country, we are only just beginning to really invest to meet that crisis. But boy, do we have a long way to go. And we've seen some amazing gains. We have seen a better understanding in people's on what mental health means more compassion from our mental health as we've all experienced the intensity of the lockdowns. And we have seen some investment um, and government investment in mental health, but as I said, such a long way to go. So this pandemic has really seen young Australians across the country hit pause. Their lives, and they've just had to hit pause at a time in their lives when they really would have expected to be traveling, have adventures, work, build a career, study and just have fun. And it was amazing to see Mark talk about that civil, that your engagement um, and that young people were so um, uh, active and involved in, in engagement. They are um, our future. And instead of this, Instead of that engagement, they've had to endure two years of extended lockdowns, online classes, and of course now they have this terrible, terrible, terrible scramble to get access to the vaccine. I think lots of Australians, um, including those people online here, had really hoped or expected that things would be better by now. And that the never ending, never endingness of what we've been experienced um, which has come with such a heavy toll, might have been at an end, but it's not. And so anxiety and depression rates are climbing. Crisis lines are seeing more calls than they have seen in their 58 year history. And it is absolutely devastating that every day in New South Wales, more than 40 children and teenagers attend emergency departments for self-harm. Every day, 40 children and teenagers. And of course, for Indigenous Australians, it's trauma on top of existing years of trauma. So, you know, the discussion tonight to try and pick up the idea of hope and not just the devastation of what's happened with mental health is really about how can we and how should we all work together to address some of these challenges and the challenges we face. So drawing on the expertise and the expertise of ordinary people's lives and really listening to what people say. So it's clear from what young people are telling us and the research that economic insecurity and unemployment and the prospect of unemployment were key drivers of mental distress. And that one of the most important supports we made available last year was not actually um, in response to mental health was not actually a health response. It was actually in the economic supports. That last year, young people were more likely to access both JobKeeper and increase in youth allowance and JobSeeker than any other groups. And yet those aren't available now. 
and they really should be. Young people have been incredibly selfless in our battle against COVID. They gave up so much to protect older Australians. They're working in essential industries, they're working at supermarket checkouts, and I really think it's time we paid it forward. I really think it's time we helped young Australians build back stronger because they are going to be the force that builds back stronger. And if anyone's interested in joining, then I'll just keep my head out the way and you can see the, um, the link to the webpage for the mental health think tank. And I'm really excited to um, look to engage with as many people as possible about the conversation about how we can build a mentally healthy Australia. And a shout out to Mark and the Policy Lab. Um, it's been a fantastic collaboration. And um, Helen Christensen and Ian Hickey, who I can see online as parts of the uh, Norfolk Mental Health Think Tank Board. Thank you. Thank you so much, Marie. It's such important work that the Mental Health Think Tank is doing right now in what is the silent pandemic facing everyone all today. Um, so now I want to introduce you to a project that I've been very lucky to be working on this year, the Strengthening Australian Civil Society Initiative, which is funded by Glyn Davis's Paul Ramsey Foundation. I'm pleased to call upon Anita Tang from Australian Progress, um, who's going to introduce the project as well as two wonderful representatives of the work that we're doing. Over to you, Anita. Thank you, Leah. It's such a privilege to be here. I'm joining you tonight from the land of the Goombah Gear people and want to acknowledge and pay my respects to Elders past and present and to all the First Nations folk who I can see are online tonight. I'm a trainer, facilitator and organiser working across civil society from an organisation called Australian Progress. We're focused on strengthening the capacity of civil society around systems change. So this is a great fit for the work that this project is doing. It's clear that the pandemic has added to pressures already at play in society. It's driving deeper economic inequality. And now in Sydney in particular, the differential lockdown restrictions that are much harsher in those suburbs that are occupied by people of colour and people of low incomes. We know that civil society, that COVID has forced civil society to grapple not only with increased demand and the impact of intersecting crises, but also come up with whole new ways of working. But it's also shifted the political landscape and a sense of what's possible in terms of supporting communities and individuals. So this initiative, the St Strengthening Australian Civil Society Initiative, it's a great partnership between Sydney Policy Lab and the Paul Ramsey Foundation. It's so crucial that we examine how civil society responds to COVID. And so I wanna thank both organisations for undertaking this work. I'm really hopeful that this work can help us answer the big questions of how we create a thriving community. And I am an optimist by nature, those of you who know me, and I believe that there are some silver linings to the pandemic cloud. There are now swathes of our community who understand that health is not an individual matter, but a collective community effort, and that financial and job security is driven by external conditions. And we even have governments who have adopted measures that would have been unthinkable pre-pandemic. But right now, it actually feels as if the current government reactions to the latest outbreak will actually double down on exacerbating inequality and polarise our community. This is a pivotal moment and the role of civil society will become more important than ever. So it's exciting to know that the research team's been speaking with hundreds of people across civil society in the last year to hear their stories of the pandemic and to unpack what these experiences tell us about leadership, about community connections, about systems and about advocacy. It's clear that a strong civil society is one that focuses on communities who most need support and where organisations are well connected to each other. And with that in mind, it's my pleasure to introduce our next two speakers who have been doing some inc sorry, incredible work and will be sharing insights from their work and why this initiative matters. And so we're going to hear firstly from Tessa boyd Kane, who's the CEO of Health Justice Australia and part of the University of Sydney alumna, and then Tara Day-Williams, who's from the Department of Social Services as a director of Stronger People, Stronger Places, and also a member of our advisory board handing over. 
Throughout 20 years of policy advocacy, I've seen the impact when policymakers with trusted relationships hear directly about the effects of their decisions. I've also seen the vulnerability that results when people are locked out of decision making about them. At Health Justice Australia, we start from the understanding that people are held in disadvantage by multiple and intersecting health, legal and social needs. And we see clearly the skills and capabilities that are required of services to address those needs. I'm thinking about the health and legal practitioners who knew community leaders in the public housing towers that were locked down in Melbourne last year, who used those relationships to identify what residents needed and to get it to them and about the pop-up clinics in southwest Sydney and western New South Wales that are drawing on local knowledge of where and how people will feel safe and confident accessing COVID tests or vaccination. These community-led responses are effective because they draw on local knowledge of what is working and what needs to change. Health Justice Australia increases and translates this impact to different contexts, facilitating learning in the health and legal systems, sharing knowledge about emerging needs and effective responses, and funneling these insights into policy and funding decisions. We've learned that these responses don't work by throwing money at them when a crisis hits. As Nimat showed us earlier, it's because they draw on existing trusted relationships that they can be mobilised in a crisis. We need philanthropic and government investment in building and sustaining these relationships over time, across the range of services working to meet community needs and between those services and the communities they support. Funding the hard work to build trusted relationships that value local knowledge at different levels of the system may be new ground for many funders in Australia. But the promise of what's possible with more investment is already there. When we get this right, it's transformative. Thanks, Tessa. I give my respects to Turrbal elders and people and thank them for their contributions to our culture, our society and our economy. There are two streams that connect me personally to the work to strengthen civil society. The first is lived experience of poverty and violence and also a deep unconditional love as a child. And from these experiences, I hold the drive to create greater equity in our world. The second is having the privilege of working in partnership with communities and the visibility of the amplified and different nature of impacts from community led change. The work I lead on behalf of the Australian Government is enabling communities to shift the dial, to change the system with local solutions. The goal of the initiative, called Stronger Places, Stronger People, is to shift disadvantage, to disrupt the parts of the system that disproportionately concentrate disadvantage in particular places. We are working in partnership, addressing inequity as it is experienced in communities, for example, as racism. We are starting to change the system collaboratively and we are seeing early community, early results rather, in communities that include Burke and Mildura. This is long-term work and needs sustained commitment. The aspect of the Sydney Policy Lab work that most strongly resonates with me is a focus on leadership, a different type of leadership that has a clarity of purpose, takes a systems approach and has a sophistication to adapt to context holistically that is not limited to silos and programmatic approaches or service responses. It is a leadership approach that is ethical, capable of adapting, is empowering and always learning. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you so much to the Strengthening Civil Society team. I am so proud to be uh, working on this project with you all. Now, at the lab, we sometimes we initiate long term projects and sometimes we build projects in response to urgent circumstances. That is what we did with the Open Society Common Purpose Task Force. We could see over a year ago that there was a vacuum of leadership when it came to considering how Australia could re-engage safely with the world. 
and strengthen our social foundation as we transition to living with COVID. We knew that any transition needed to be guided by a broad range of voices, from politics to business, education, arts and creative industries, law and civil society. In the heat of national debate, our University Chancellor Belinda Hutchinson worked with Tim Supamasan and Mark Steers to build an unusual alliance and ran a series of public hearings. Mark Rigotti, partner and senior advisor at, the Her at Herbert Smith Freehills and chair of the Open Society Common Purpose Task Force, will tell us a little bit about what they did. Over to you, Mark. Thank you, Leah, and thank you uh, to everyone else who's made a contribution. I really enjoyed listening to it. I too would like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land on which we all meet tonight. Um, and it's been an honour to serve in the role as chair of the task force. I've learned a lot and I've enjoyed it. I was also hoping that it has added to the solidarity, the coming together and the togetherness that we desperately need. I was asked to speak tonight a little bit about how we went about our work. Well, there were six broad elements. The first has been alluded to and was around the composition of the task force. And Mark and Tim uh, were very deliberate and members were drawn from different parts of society, including civil society, the arts, academia and business. Second element was the approach we took, and that was to be positive, forward looking and solution orientated. It was actually quite difficult, especially with the politicisation of the pandemic's management and the alarmist approach of much of the media. There was a temptation in a lot of the discussion to identify what went wrong, who to blame. So we elected to assume positive intent and to develop our recommendations emanating from strong foundations to take the nation forward. Third element was around a stepping stone process, which was very illuminating. The process of the task force was to develop the thinking by building on a series of work activities. So we had some great academic inputs, including from Marie that we heard uh, just a couple of minutes ago. We had some external polling from PR firms to better understand public sentiment. We had a series of round tables with a deliberate mixture of people from all different walks of life and different perspectives. And there was the rolling task force discussion about the issues. Fourth element was to professionalise the write-up. We utilised a professional writer to bring together our thinking. And this was a positive step. It brought a degree of objectivity and probably balanced out a little bit of the group think that can sometimes develop in those environments. Fifth element, we told people about what we did. Uh, we held a launch event and we undertook a media campaign with the assistance of some professional advisors. That was successful and meant we achieved some momentum and coverage that exceeded our expectations. And six and finally, I guess as chair, I was trying to develop a learning culture and I felt we developed that. Each of us went on an individual and a collective journey as we listened to the different perspectives, the different experiences and stories. And we also took the opportunity at the end to pause and reflect on what we could do differently and better next time round. So I guess the final reflection, the, the work of the task force continues, albeit sporadically and less intensely. I was very struck by one of the round tables that we held. I attended all of them, um, tried not to speak, to listen. And it was a round table with younger people as our participants. We had a great turnout. We had really excellent participation. There was no killer idea which emerged from the round table. What struck me was the raw impact of the pandemic on these young people. They were eloquent, highly qualified, broad thinkers, leaders, and very competent. But they were doing it tough. Some spoke of mental health challenges. One young woman spoke of having to sleep in her car when she became unemployed when COVID hit and could not get her government support processed in time to pay the rent. Not quite the future for a master's graduate from a group of eight institution that we would all envisage in this country. And it was at that moment that the nexus between the academic insight we'd received and the lived experience was made by their stories and struggles. It also brought home to me the need for hope and urgency, both of which we tried to inject into our recommendations and the prosecution of them. My highest hope 
I hope our leaders can deliver on the hope and the urgency we need. Thank you, Mark. The task force work really does show that in the face of an urgent crisis, we can produce swift yet incisive solutions to complex problems informed by people's everyday experiences. Now, finally, what about the future? I just wanna let you all know, we've got two more speakers left um, and we've got Mark Scott coming up very shortly. But before we do that, I wanna tell you a little bit about one special person and a special program that we've got going uh, at the Sydney Policy Lab. Now, the lab not only seeks to build connections with communities beyond the university, but we also work to support our university staff to powerfully make these connections in their research and professional work every day. To do this, in 2019, we created lab classes. These began as an eight week training for academics and professional staff to explore the skills, strengths and relationships needed for powerful collaboration. Even a pandemic has not slowed us down. In three years, we've trained over 1,000 people. Now, to tell you all about the impact of this training, I want to invite one of our excellent graduates to speak, Katie Moore, a Radjuri woman, project manager with DVC Research and a future PhD, is going to tell us about the lab programs. Katie, over to you. Thanks, Leah. You're a Dimarang. I would like to thank Yvonne for her welcome to country earlier and for being the leader of change as chair of Metro Lao and throughout this city. I want to personally acknowledge the countries that we're each gathered on today, to those ancient ones and today's elders who have cared not only for the lands, language, culture, but held centuries of knowledge and fought for a time when we could create a better way together. I acknowledge the ongoing trauma. I see you. I acknowledge you the struggles and don't take that responsibility lightly. You and do Katie. Hi, my name is Katie Moore and I'm a proud Radjuri woman, but I'm also a proud Aussie. I grew up in Western Sydney in a prototypical suburban life, a life where I didn't think the University of Sydney was an option for me. But today, this is where I am in the research portfolio, managing external research partnerships. Two months ago, I walked across that great hall as a uni's first Indigenous MBA graduate. In 2021, that makes me proud, but also disappointed that in 20, 200 years of education, we haven't come that far. I've been passionate about creating change my whole life. It has taken me across roles in early education to studying tourism, working in roles in hotel management and into Indigenous economic development, where we partnered with Indigenous communities to create wealth and opportunities for self-determination. I wouldn't have planned it out that this way, but there's nowhere else I'd rather be. This uni can do so much good and I wanna be part of making that happen. Three years ago, I met the Sydney Policy Lab. This led me to be invited to these collaborating beyond the university lab classes. This started as a learning journey and relationships would live out the mantra, relationships precede action. This is where I met Mark and Amanda and they show me in a class of 40 other academics and professional staff, a new model of creating change. One that I was intrigued by, one that prioritized relationships and highlighted the critical role of power in creating a better world. Alongside this, I also had a highly respected professor, now basically adopted family, who consistently encouraged me to drop this MBA thing and become an academic. It was the relationships forged in those lab classes and the lived reality of backing it up with genuine actions that led me to decide to do a PhD, working with my friends in the lab, colleagues across campus, and in partnership with community, working towards a real deal for all Australians. Amazing, thank you, Katie. We are so lucky to have you working with us on the Real Deal Project. Wow, what a range of projects, like what a whirlwind we've had and it's incredible to see uh, all the things that we're doing and the wonderful people that we work with across the country. I feel very lucky to be at the lab at this very important time. So thank you all to all of those speakers. It is rare to see the words of a book come alive, but 
out of the ordinary is very much amongst us in a set of growing unusual coalitions of organisations in Sydney and across Australia. And to close our evening, I am thrilled to introduce our new leader, someone who has transformed the media in this country and helped New South Wales to build an education system for the 21st century. He now leads the university as it seeks to connect even more profoundly with the community around us, the new Vice-Chancellor, Mark Scott. Well, thanks, Leah. And ladies and gentlemen, lovely to be with you uh, and to have sat through these great conversations that we've had uh, this evening. I'm on the land of the Camaragal people and want to acknowledge elders past, present and emerging. And uh, I, there are a few things I just want to do that would be more traditional if we were in the room together. And the first thing I'd do if I'd grab the microphone after acknowledging country would be to acknowledge the great work of Leah in coordinating and leading uh, the conversation tonight. And there'd be rapturous applause that would deafen us all. And uh, we're sending out those uh, thanks to you, Leah, for your great leadership uh, tonight. There's a, a second ritual I'll follow and we'll get to that um, at the end. You know, it's interesting. It's such a challenging, demanding, complex time. But there is a line of optimism that goes through uh, the conversation this evening, I think, and it's given us so much to, to think about and to reflect on. Uh, but I think there's finally an encouraging message there. You know, you know, one of the things I think you can say clearly about COVID, when, when we get to the other side of this experience, when life returns back to normal, there, there will be many a PhD written about what we've learned through the COVID experience, and I look forward to being at the graduation day when Katie Moore gets her PhD uh, from the University of Sydney. Uh, but, but, but one of the questions I've been thinking about for a while is what will we, how will we reflect on leadership uh, and leadership during COVID? Because I think the challenges to leadership have been so evident uh, for many of us over the last year and a half. I think you can make an argument that even before COVID, leadership had been stretched in this country and, and elsewhere around the world. Our political leaders have really struggled to have mastery of an increasingly binary political environment, the pressures of a 24 hour news cycle, uh, the dominance of the social media narrative. Uh, politicians had found it hard to have mastery of that discourse and to be able to bring people uh, on a journey to follow them to a place where they may not have known they wanted to go or, or needed to go. And then you throw COVID on top of it, where there's no handbook, where there's a totally changing fact base, where they have limited life experiences. Uh, to, to guide their way through. And I, I've been a senior bureaucrat in the back room providing advice. We were all in unknown places and even trying to understand what the virus was and how it was operating and how it was changing, these things were very, very taxing. And I, I think would say that our political leadership has struggled. And, and one of the interesting reflections I think in Australia is to reflect on how far we've moved from the early hope and optimism of the national cabinet when really the great challenges of our federation um, looked like that they were going to be transformed by a new unity and consensus and coming together at a federal and state level. And just how testing and taxing that national cabinet experience proved to be through the lived reality of, uh, of COVID-19. So when you think about you know, political leadership at this time, what, what I find extraordinary is the is the theatrics of the press conferences. You know, we now set up our lockdown days. What time is it? What time is Dan on? Uh, is Gladys on at 11 o'clock? Is the Prime Minister coming in afterwards, sitting around, sending messages? I, I have a, a, a chain with members of my family. And if, um, if we're busy on Zooms, whatever, other members are just texting through the numbers and the updates and what's being said. But, but in a way, in a, in a real sense, it's been leadership as performance. And um, a vast amount of, uh, a vast volume of words being disseminated by our leaders every day, often the same messages over and over again. And the limits of that style of leadership, I think, have been uh, revealed by the challenges through COVID. And, and in a very real sense, I think for, for members of a, a political elite or an education elite like me, where we've put a lot of confidence in the power of the press conference, the sheer limit of that uh, source of communication 
to really reach into all parts of our society and uh, all aspects of our community. And the limits of the authority of our political leaders telling us what to do, I think, has been evident and particularly challenging to the nature of discourse that we've had now. And so that's why I love what we heard from uh, Neemat Kabutli earlier when she said that real leadership is not about fancy titles. Leadership is about investing in power and uh, supporting uh, through dignity. And, and I think one of the things we've learned tonight is that we, we, if we've been looking for leadership in COVID-19, perhaps we've been looking uh, in the wrong places because the places where you've seen real transformation of communities under extraordinary pressure, like in the Housing Commission uh, Towers in Melbourne last year, or in the um, parts of southwestern Sydney, locked down with helicopters in the sky, as Mark referenced earlier, and curfews at night. It's been strong actions of the community uh, working together that's seen transformation to change. A sense of leadership through partnership, a sense of leadership being driven through deep insight to the lived experiences of people on the ground, and leadership demonstrated not by talking, but informed by deep listening and deep understanding of all the challenges that take place. Leadership that's the antithesis of the remoteness and sense of out of touch um, engagement that we sometimes have felt uh, from our um, uh, leaders in the last 18 months. A sense that they simply have not understood or been able to connect with the lived experience that we have now. And, and the despair, in fact, that many people feel about um, others not understanding what this lived experience is, we're seeing the full consequences of in, in our society. Um, what, what, I've, what I've loved tonight is the demonstration we've heard from the multiple case studies about leadership that's based on deep listening and deep insight and deep connectedness. Um, we heard from uh, Tessa earlier about the challenge when people feel locked out. And, and what we've heard about leadership tonight is those on the ground connected and engaged with community, providing insight, providing solutions. And the ability, the recognition that our leadership really provide needs different teams of people operating together in a genuinely collaborative way. It strikes me that um, COVID-19 has demonstrated the power and importance of multidisciplinary uh, engagement, even on COVID-19 itself. You think of the challenges that we've had to deal with in the last 18 months. Firstly, there's a new disease, what is it? And uh, Eddie Holm, our scientist at um, the University of Sydney was the, the first person to post the genome that then triggered the search for the scientists for solutions in terms of vaccines. And then once vaccines are created, well, how do you manufacture them? And then how do you distribute them? And then how do you convince people to have the jab and the big behavioural change? How do you deal with fake news? How do you deal with the consequences of lockdown? Truly every facet of COVID-19 demanding deep expertise, deep knowledge, deep insight and deep cooperation that's required. The embodiment of multidisciplinary problem solving to the most complex issues that we face. And that's what I think we've heard tonight and the examples showcased by the policy lab the need to bring in different voices and different levels of expertise and to respect that expertise to jointly problem solve and operate together. You know, it, it strikes me that, you know, it's often said that, that the answers are in the room to important questions. The answers are in the room, but really for the answers to be in the room, you need the right people in the room and people who have that insight and that understanding and that expertise and on COVID-19, uh, you know, it's not just the scientists, it's not just psychologists, it's not just the economists, it's people with lived experience in different communities, as well as the artists and the writers, all of who create an environment of common insight and common understanding. And, and, and I'm heartened in a sense by what we've heard tonight when I think of the future of the university, because I really think at the core of the work of the university of the future will be these multidisciplinary endeavours that the answers will come in the coming together of people with deep insight and deep understanding and deep expertise and sharing that insight and that expertise and learning from each other and together constructing solutions that are relevant and compelling and engaging for the real complexity of the problems that we face together. And one of our challenges at the University of Sydney 
is to develop that multidisciplinary capability that the Sydney Policy Lab uh, embodies, I think, that says that we want to find the experts and create the space for them to think and talk and work together and to find that expertise and bring it in so that together we can find solutions to the most compelling policy issues um, or pressing social issues that we face. And I know it's important that we do that as a university, uh, not just because that's where we're going to find the answers to um, these pressing social issues, but it's also because the university is truly a community asset. It's part of the crown jewel of, of our society. What happens at the university is not just for the benefit of those who work at the university or study at the university. The great asset of the university is the benefit that comes to bear from the work that takes place within the university for all members of our community, no matter where they live, no matter what they do, no matter what association they have with the university. If they have any association at all, this is what the benefit of the great work that takes place at the university brings. And the Sydney Policy Lab, I believe, is showcasing the way that a university of the future will work together. And the final point I'd, I'd make is that I see the power of the university demonstrated from what we've heard tonight, not just in research, but in the work that we do with training up our young people through their educational experience with us. We have a, a maxim at the university we talk about often, and that is, leadership for good. And I think what this really demonstrates, the leadership that's been modelled tonight, not leadership at an 11 o'clock press conference, but leadership with insight in communities, means that the work that we need to do to give uh, our students not just deep knowledge of their subject areas, but the capabilities that they need, the communication skills, the collaboration skills, the critical thinking, the creative thinking, the ability to be able to articulate a challenge and formulate a response. That's what our investment in students is bringing and that's where the future of the nation uh, belongs. You know, um, in Mark's book, he, he writes early on about how we've lost faith in the ability of ordinary people to shape the future of our country. But he articulates the extraordinary power of everyday life and everyday leadership. And the second thing I wanted to do, and I'd be doing in person, is I'd be holding up a copy of Mark's book tonight, which I read some months ago. I loved it. I loved it. I loved it because it, it didn't just talk about the, the writers that I loved, like Dylan Thomas and George Orwell and J.D. Priestley. It explained to me part of uh, 20th century history that I never really focused on the years after the war, but it celebrates leadership that comes through a community faced by crisis, having endured trauma, together working to find a better place out of the ordinary, uh, how everyday life inspired a nation then and how it could do so now. Now, interestingly, talking with Mark, I know he's um, been thinking about this book for years, uh, but, you know, the old line, cometh the hour, cometh the man, this is the right book for this time, because these lessons from 70 years ago are so compelling to the challenges we face today. So, you know, if we're in a room, you know, Mark would be up the back now with a pen signing the copies you purchase. So I want you to get online and buy a copy. And then when you see Mark, he'll sign it for you. And thank you, just like if we were in the room tonight. I'm gonna to pause there. I wanna con uh, congratulate everyone and the Sydney Policy Lab in particular for their leadership and the great work they're doing. You know, I love the way they've showcased it tonight, compelling case studies. And to Mark, uh, the leader of the Sydney Policy Lab, congratulations and thanks for this wonderful book and thanks for your great leadership here at the University of Sydney. Thank you so much, Mark, for all of that. You know, what tonight has really been about and what, it's, what I'm reflecting on now hearing everybody is, it's about coming together across our differences and connecting and building relationships on common purpose. But importantly, just hearing Mark speak just then, something I'm thinking jewels in the crown that we've heard from tonight, the real leaders, the everyday leaders that are doing this work on the ground every day. And so if we've been successful tonight, 
I hope that you will walk away with a greater energy to reach out knowing that by working together across our differences, we can make a big change, starting even with small relationships. And that begins with you. And that concludes the formalities for tonight. I wanna to thank you all for coming on a Thursday night. Um, and if you wanna continue the conversation, we are keeping it going on Twitter. And please reach out, connect with others, the people that you've been chatting to in our chat box below and on the interwebs. I want to importantly thank all of our speakers who, and who've been showcasing the work that they've been doing tonight. And importantly, the amazing team at the Sydney Policy Lab who've been running around behind the scenes working really hard to bring this wonderful event together. This is, I think, one of the largest events that we've held as a lab. Um, and I want to thank each and every one of you for being a part of it. Stay safe. See you all on the other side. Thank you and good night.